computer. All right, we are officially recording. Hello? Hello? Okay, sorry, I thought there was a, um, an echo on my end. Hey guys, sorry, we had some technical difficulties um, connecting the Zoom to Facebook Live. We did it earlier today and guess what? Worked with no problems. Uh, we tried it tonight and it didn't work and we don't know why. Uh, we'll keep working on that as we do this. So, um, hopefully you're going to, you're watching this in the seven o'clock hour, which is super great that at least we get to, to do that. Um, so we are in, we're going to jump right into it. If you guys don't know the guy next to me, that's Jeremy. That's our senior minister. Say, Hey, Jeremy. Hello. Um, he is, uh, he's joining me tonight because we just really like the technology of being able to do this together and have this conversation. Um, we are in first Peter, the entire letter. Uh, we're going to be looking at chapter two specifically tonight. So go on and grab your Bibles, go to first Peter, uh, chapter two earlier today. I randomly took my notebook out of my backpack because I wanted to look at something in my office. And then I forgot to put my notebook in my backpack, I have no notes. Um, so uh, if this is a little out there, it's because I have no notes. So luckily we're bringing Jeremy in to make sure that we all stay calm and relaxed and, and I don't go too, too crazy. Um, but if you have not watched, here's the neat thing about filming these, Jeremy. I sent this in the email today. If you hadn't watched the first class, you can just go and watch it. And That's so right. you get to catch up. You're not like, oh, what did they talk about last week? You can go and watch that on YouTube and or Facebook. And I emailed that out today. Um, and we gave a quick bit of background on Peter. And basically what you have is Peter is writing this letter to a group of Christians spread out that are under persecution. There's all, and all types of level of persecution. So this letter is specifically written to those that are suffering, to those that are in a dark time, a tumultuous time, a disruptive time. Um, now, as I made very clear last week, and I stand by, what we are going through right now is not persecution. We are going through a dark, tumultuous time that has disrupted our normal, but I want us to be careful that we don't uh, oversell this idea that we're, we're, we're being persecuted. As I said last week, we are going to get back together. We are going to join together. We're going to worship together. We're going to rejoice together. It's going to be beautiful. But that doesn't mean that there isn't something that we can glean from Peter as he talks about suffering in this particular situation. So we went verse by verse. We slowly moved through each verse, uh, looking at Peter's story, um, how he starts it out with identity language. You are chosen by God. He then praises God, and then he kind of gives some marching orders, and then he invites us into the story. It's the story that the prophets were telling, even though they didn't see all of it. We're invited into that story. So we get into verse 22 of chapter 1, and we're just going to launch right into this. Um, Jeremy, do you have any uh, comments on, on Peter? I know we weren't co-teaching last week, but just the letter in general. No, I mean, just um, historically speaking, this is around the time, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that, that, um, that Nero had taken the reins of the Romans and was, uh, was leading. And so Peter is kind of um, almost dovetailing into the book of Revelation a little bit um, yep. into this great persecution. So uh, Peter is kind of prepping them um, as, at the same time as... Um, you know, what, what John is going to reveal later in Revelation, but it's, uh, it's prepping them for what is an actual persecution that ended up uh, really coming because not only did Nero hate them, but um, Nero, under Nero's reign, um, Rome burned, and so he was going to blame it on the Christians. Right. Uh, and so, so that great persecution, there was a lot of polit politics behind the persecution, that's right. Um, and completely unlike today, which is a pandemic, very similar to any pandemic or plague that came upon the people. That wasn't seen as religious persecution. It was seen as a sickness. That's right. 
And I'm glad you brought Nero up because we're going to bring him up a little bit later because Peter okay. mentions him. I mean, not by name, but, sure. but as far as that role. So I'm glad you brought that up. Let's look at verse 22 in chapter one. And when we're going to, we're going to try to move quickly. Remember, he's setting this all up. And then he says, you were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Love each other deeply with all of your heart. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. As the scripture says, people are like grass. Their beauty is like flower in the fields. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. Right off the bat in verse 22, I love where Peter goes because he says, you were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now, and I love that word, and I think that's clear, because you are cleansed, because Jesus has restored you and reconciled you and sanctified you, you must now show sincere love. Again, we have this gospel truth that it is not just a horizontal relationship with you and God, that when you turn your face to Jesus, when you come to the cross, when you die to, to all of those sinful things, and you are resurrected anew, you now, the, the consequence of that is loving one another. You know, sometimes I think we can, I want to be very careful here, I think we can oversell the personal relationship with Jesus part of the Christian walk. I definitely think it's there, but if we stop there, I think we're missing something very, very pivotal here. And so Peter very blatantly says, hey, look, you are cleansed from your sins. So now you need to love one another. And then look at what he says. You need to love each other deeply. You need to love each other. You need to engage with people deeply. Um, you know, tune in on that, Jeremy. Uh, give me your thoughts on that. I, I love the fact that the gospel will not let you remain in individualistic isolation. Yeah, and I think he, com he, I think he compounds that. Um, when he in verse uh 23 uh there at the end when he's talking about this same same idea that jesus told nicodemus about this this uh kind of this idea of being born again mm -hmm. um and uh but i love how he defines it because he says um your new life in other words your the process of being born again this new life will last forever because it comes from, that word is literally, it is originated from, it is birthed from mm -hmm. the eternal living word of God. So, so here's what I used to struggle with. What I used to struggle with is, okay, what does that mean? Uh, because Peter writes this, but they weren't all carrying around New Testaments. Mm. <laughs> that didn't yep. happen until like an additional 300 years later. Um, and so, so what is the word of God then? The word of God is this gospel truth of this new life. It is passed down for them orally through these, uh, maybe you could say miraculous tongue speech, or you could say, uh, and, and also miraculous interpretation. But there's this, also it's inclusive of the old word of God, which is the Old Testament as a continuation into where they live now as a prophetic word of this more perfect time that they live in. But I love to me when Peter says that your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God, it kills every excuse Christians have to say, well, you know, my spiritual gift is I love to serve. I just really don't like to read the Bible a lot. Well, then guess what? At some point you're going to be emptied completely. Um, I think it was you that sent me that text message this week referencing um, the Bible scholar, uh, and I say Bible scholar, some people will scoff at that, but Beth Moore, the, the t avid teacher, and I think she is a scholar. She's a student of God's word, but it's one of those things where she states, if you are not in the word and you're, if you're not, you're not going to grow. You're not going to be discipled, and so I think that's what Peter is trying to get at. He's saying, if you want to be like Jesus, you better, you better get in the word. It's a prerequisite. 
And and I'm going to add to that that I think the word is also Jesus, you know, yeah, revealed absolutely. as absolutely. as on um, that. But I, I'm so glad you brought up the point that a lot of times we take a scripture like that and we say, "See, this is how important the New Testament is," and we're like, "Wait a second, yeah, Peter didn't even have the New Testament at right. this point." You know, right. um, and you could even argue when he mentions Paul's letter in Second Peter, that doesn't happen until a, a, a while beyond that. So you're right. right. He's talking about, he had already mentioned him. He's talking about the prophets. Who did he right. just quote right before he says this? Right. Isaiah. Yeah. So he's leaning into that Old Testament, which eventually, as we know, as Jesus says in John, you know, you search the scriptures looking for me, but you're not even, you don't find me. Yeah, um, you're right. He Because he closes that out in verse 25, because he says in that word, that very word uh, is the good news that was preached to you. Absolutely. But, so, yeah. And then, and then look at where he goes in chapter two. And I think it's the same opening. I, I don't love the chapter split right here because he says, so get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness, which there's a few things going on here. And one of the things is you just said, you know, we're supposed to crave growth in our salvation. We're supposed yeah. to cry out for, for more of God's word. And it's like you said, if you run into these people that are like, yeah, I just really don't spend that much time in the word. I'll just let you handle that preacher. My goodness, they're not crying out for that spiritual milk. They're not crying out for that. But I love how Peter gives that juxtaposition, if you will, of, hey, you're cleansed of your sins, love one another. This is the word preached to you. So you need to repent. You need to get rid of the evil behavior. This is a brand new lifestyle. This is not just a new ethic. This is an absolute changing of your character that is repentant and changing from the sin portions of your life while also pursuing and craving more of the life that God has promised. Yeah. And I'm interested, Seth, on what happens in the church um, when, why do people leave that? I, I don't believe that when people come into their salvation, in very few instances, do I think somebody comes into their salvation halfway and it's kind of like, mm -hmm. mm, I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. I think that a lot of people come into their salvation looking for radical things to happen. You know what yep. I mean? God to be at work and all these other things. Somewhere though, there is either a slow separation from that. Um, maybe that's the church's fault because we haven't discipled people. That mm -hmm. word has kind of gone away and become unpopular. And, and so I see its popularity coming back now, but you, but we've got this thing where church for many people becomes, um, well, I'll go because I like it. They believe what I believe and they perform like I want them to perform and they do things like I want them to do. And so I'm very safe in this environment. Mm -hmm. And church is not about the excitement about growing in God's word, which is why that kind of fades. And they get into this, I don't know, this uh, self-centered feed me, but only under my conditions yep. um, type of situation. So the psychologically, I really wrestle with wondering what it is that causes that initial separation. Oh yeah. Well, and it, uh, it's funny. Peter says, crave spiritual milk. Hebrew writer says, y'all need to get past the milk, get to the real food, you know? <laughs> so you're like, wait a second, which one? I, I think they're talking about the same thing. They just use a different vernacular, but I think it's really neat that Jesus, I mean, that Peter actually says, Hey, you need to be like a baby. And what I mean by this is babies have to be sustained by something greater than them. And that is right. their parents. And so a baby cries out for it and the parent gives it, but the baby cannot sustain on their own. Everything you just said to me is Christian saying, oh, I've tasted it. I got it. I've got pride. I can handle this myself. And we don't know how to fully empty ourselves anymore. Yeah. We don't know how to fully give ourselves over to God. We don't know how to be like a baby that is craving what God has to teach us. In chapter one, Paul, uh, Peter actually says that when it comes to uh, trusting in God, 
that we rejoice with an inexpressible joy. We spent some time on that word inexpressible because very often we say, you know, well, no, we need to be very serious, maybe very solemn. And then Peter turns around and says, hey, I want you to be like a baby crying out for this stuff, right? Yeah. Now, what's funny is that's almost annoying sometimes, right? Mm. But I think there's a metaphor here that we miss and we get complacent, like you said. We get comfortable. We get, we get in a place where, you know, we, we like exactly how things are going. And so we don't even know what it is to cry out to grow more. Mm -hmm. And I think, too, there is the opposite side of this where Peter, the, the beauty about the whole babes and spiritual milk and being, being dependent upon an authority greater than yours, helping you to be responsible for that transformation says, I want you to also grow, but I want you to be careful that you don't begin to worship knowledge yeah. as the be all end all of what this, what this maturation process is. Like when he mentions the process of maturity, he doesn't say, get all your doctrines down and in order. He says, right. get rid of deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, simple things that are- And, and love one another. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, another. absolutely. Oh, yeah. Because you've got, you've got a couple scriptures that point to us about point out the dangers of knowledge too much knowledge makes us arrogant. It puffs us up. Yep. And, um, and I think that's one way maybe we have erred in the past is trying to make sure we have all things right rather that's than, right. And, and, and we have terrible character, but all the right doctrines, mm -hmm. at least we think. We do. Well, and I think, I think that fits well into that baby metaphor. That's a real neat take. Um, so we, we move on, you know, and then he says, okay, so here's the changes that you make. Now, here's why this is such a big deal. And he brings Jesus into focus. You are coming, verse four of chapter two, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are the living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priest. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is a stone that makes people stumble the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. So this, 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 is, not the, it's, this is in Ephesians. This is quoted out of Isaiah and out of Psalms, this idea of a cornerstone. Um, I like the way N.T. Wright laid it out. It was really simple. You're building a building and you're building the corner of it and you have a stone that doesn't fit. So you reject it and you toss it out. And then when you get to the top of the building, the top of that corner, there's one more stone that needs to go up there. And all of a sudden you realize the one you threw off to the side is actually the perfect one. And it becomes the one of prominence, a very specific metaphor of rejection. And then, you know, but it being the actual cornerstone. Now we both recently in the very near past have walked through the temple in the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the Shekinah or the Shekinah, the presence of God. And then through Jesus realizing we are now the temple of God. We are the Shekinah in the world. We are the place for God. And here's yet another one of those beautiful verses. Um, in verse five, you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. I, that language, by the way, is life-changing language for me. Um, walking through scripture and seeing that God, through Jesus, has invited me into his story to be a, part, a stone in this temple that he's building. Basically, what he's wanting to do is build this worldwide temple that's made of people everywhere, meaning his presence. Oh, so we don't have to get on the road to Jerusalem, right? We don't have to get on the road to the tabernacle. We are through the, the spirit of Jesus residing within us. We become these living stones. We become these walking, talking temples 
of the living God. And then he says, and that makes you a priest. Now he says this again, but he's coming out of Exodus chapter 19, where God's, I mean, a a quote we're going to see in its fullness. But what does a priest do? It mediates between people and God. It reveals the nature and character of God. That call on our life, you know, all of a sudden we say, okay, well, no evil behavior, right? That's, a, that's an ethic. But then we realize that it's even more than that. No, Peter isn't just calling us to a new ethic. He's saying you are living, breathing representations of the temple of God where he meets earth. And I don't, this is just me. If that does not give your life and your vocation and your relationships just beautiful purpose, that what you do matters in the name of Jesus. I, I don't know what else, you know, I don't know what else we can say to say you matter to God so much that he wants you to be a living stone in his temple. So one of the cool things about um, this last visit to the Holy Land was, um, and you knew I was going to have to go there sometime, but um when you go to the uh, Wailing Wall, which is, uh, you know, the really a, a portion of the outside wall that's open and congregants or, or Jews can go or, or Christians can go to this wall and uh, pray and they, people slide these little prayers in there and all that stuff sticking in the cracks of the wall. They've unearthed the uh, original layer and there's a tunnel that goes down the, the entire length of the wall. The cool thing that they unearthed that that I did not get to physically touch or see, but I could have if it had been available to us during that tour. But there is a chief cornerstone there that that was laid to build the Temple Mount. Now, not the temple, which is this example here, but it's the Temple Mount. And the amazing thing was our guide was talking about this chief cornerstone deal, and he was using this as as an example of the temple and of the building where one is not like the other. And he was saying, when they built like that, they were intentional about the chief cornerstone. And so, so this word would have had great familiarity to these people. Yeah. But this stone is as heavy as three 747 jetliners. And it was not cut there. In other words, it was moved. But it was such an important piece that they had it moved because if if you look at that stone and you look at all the other stones, they are smaller in size, yet the most important stone in the entire aspect of that building was this one unique larger than life stone. And he was saying that this is this example that Peter is using here is to say, you, you other stones, you, you are a representative of the chief cornerstone. You're an ambassador yep. of the chief cornerstone, but this chief cornerstone is radically different. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it kind of, kind of, it gave me a word, kind of a word picture, a physical yeah. representation of what that meant. That was really cool. Oh, that's great. I, I love that. Um, and then think about moving that stone. All of a sudden you realize why people trip over it, you know, <laughs> as far as Peter saying, you know, it's a stumbling block for some. Well, some people don't want to move this stone. Yeah. Some people don't want to mess with the the burden or the weight. And now, now I'm not saying that it, you know, it, Peter is saying it's, there's going to be suffering yeah. and that's going to be you tripping over these stone, this, this giant stone. But then of course, if we know Jesus, which I'm just making a correlation here, Jesus actually says my burden is light. Right. That's and right. So all of a sudden you realize, well, wait a second. So with Jesus moving the stone is what we're meant to do and be representatives of it. Like you said, I love that. Um, I was reminded of Ephesians 2. Paul says very much the same thing. Uh, Chapter 19, um, excuse me, Ephesians 2 verse 19. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with God's holy people. You are members of God's holy family. And together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit, which actually is takes your, your very physical thing and says, yeah, that's basically it. You've got the foundation laid by the word of God being the prophets and what they're sharing. And we come to the cornerstone itself and we're actually being built into this house as representatives of this, this cornerstone. Mm. And 
I, I, I particularly love the fact that again, this is so purposing. So, so we go into verse nine, and and Peter says that. Are you laughing at something off the screen right I, now? I just had a a miniature five year old ninja who was wearing a toboggan. Bring and it on! Come in and try to try to attack me. That never happens on a Wednesday night class. So that was kind of fun. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! <laughs> so it says, all right, verse nine. You are not like that, for you're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession. That's Exodus nineteen three and six. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, and now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, and now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. And so there you have that direct quote of Exodus 19. Mm -hmm. And then you see it in Peter. That's quoted again in Revelation. And mm -hmm. I love that in verse nine, it just lays it out. Because you are a royal priesthood, because you are God's very special possession, as a result, you get to show others the goodness of God. I mean, Let's let's just dwell on that sentence for one second. How convoluted have we made Christianity when we've made it about our rightness in the face of other people's wrongness? And we've made it we've made it more about our divisions than the things we're unified on. And here we're told you're a holy priesthood. And as a result, you get to share the goodness of God. Last week, I shared a story about a service worker who sang happy birthday to a 94 year old. Uh, who was isolated and couldn't have visitors. It was beautiful, but it was his quote that just grabbed me. He said, anytime I can use the grace of God to make someone happy, I'm going to do it. Mm. And, I, and I'm just, I was wrecked by that quote because so often I see the things of God being used as bludgeons and weapons. I see the things of God used as shame and guilt. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a place for conviction. There is a place for conviction. Peter says it very clear. Look, when it comes to sin and evil behavior, you got to stop that. He keeps going. He says, that stuff's waging war inside of you. Fight that. But what if we became a people who, because we were priests, we made sure that it was about sharing the goodness of God. I, I love the fact that the good news needs to be good first. I don't think it has to be bad first. We normally start with, what's the good news? Well, you're sinner and horrible, and Jesus comes. No, the good news is, is God created the world and wants to be in relationship with you. Because we are separated by that sin, he loves us so much. He sends Jesus. And when we accept Jesus, we get to share that goodness with everyone around us. Mm -hmm. Do you think we miss that sometimes as Christians, the idea that as a result of being priest, it's not about fixing people's wrongness so much as it's about sharing God's goodness? I mean, now what, what, what do you think about some of these verses? Yeah, I mean, to me, the echoes of this chapter are from time spent with Jesus where he talks about um, it's what Michael Goheen points out from the book of Isaiah all the way to Jesus's command that you are light of the world, the city on a hill cannot be hidden, all yeah. this other stuff. It's this idea of, of you are to be a light to the nations that was taken from Isaiah. And, and we, this continues now more than ever. And I think for us, I think more Christians today are, they live in shock and disbelief at the presence of sin. And we shouldn't. We should just completely know that sin is around us and sin is coming because it's promised that that won't be done away with until the return of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so, so rather than living in such a way as a, as a curmudgeon that just hates the world because of sin, we get a chance to be the antithesis to what the world expects us to be and love. And I think he caps encapsulates it in the quotation where he says, once you receive no mercy. In other words, do you remember when you constantly felt shamed and judged? You received no mercy. And then he says, now you, now you have received God's mercy. In other words, how could the recipients of this mercy not live with joy in the world, even in the presence of sin, 
That's and right. and live countercultural to the what to what the world would expect us to be. And I think that's one of the things that gives Christianity its bad reputation among people is you know is you know let's be honest um we just now are practicing social distancing but anytime we see a muslim nearby we walk 20 to 30 feet around them so we're really good at social distancing around them instead of of being a light and loving other people and being kind and considerate and accepting and, and merciful so to me peter is is really preaching a, a sermon in this message too. Oh, to people. absolutely. Well, and, and he's preaching it in a context that is brutal and, and full of persecution to these Christians, mm. you know? And here in our world, we think that sneezing in our direction is persecution, right? right, right but right. Look, at, look at what he says in 12. And this is what this one's always great. He says, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. And that's where I think we can misdefine some things because we start thinking, okay, well, what's properly? Properly is obviously shaming them for their lifestyle, even though they right. don't know Jesus. And then, you know, bludgeoning them with the word, hoping they yeah. come to get to know it. Nowhere in what Peter has said has he revealed that. In fact, he just said, because you're priest, you get to share the goodness of God. So living properly with your neighbor is loving your neighbor. Yeah. Living properly with your unbelieving neighbor is being kind and gracious to them and, and maybe not partaking in things that they partake in that you don't like, but not alienating yourself and isolating yourself away from it. In fact, it might, you know, to really get into it, I have neighbors, honestly, right now that are non-believing neighbors. And yes, they participate and say things that I don't necessarily condone, but I've decided that what I want them to know is the love of God. And so if they call me to come help them move a, a, a couch out of the back of their car, I'm going to move a couch out of the back of their car. Yep. If they come, if they want to shoot basketball, we're going to shoot basketball. If they want to have a serious, I got this question the other day, and this was neat because I've actually been praying that I have opportunities to talk to them. One of them, we're sitting outside and he goes, hey man, yeah, you're a, you're a minister. What's God's take on this whole COVID-19 thing? He brought that up. Yeah, I got to have a conversation with him about how I think God loves us and is in the midst of our suffering. And I never had to say, hey, listen here, buddy, I'm a preacher. You know, I just got to have that naturally through relationship. Um, so Peter mm -hmm. goes on as he goes into verse 13. For the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority, whether the king as head of state or the officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. It is God's will that our honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God and respect the king. All right, so I'm going to tread kind of lightly here. Here's the thing. Christians in America love not so much first Peter two 13 as they do Romans 13. Right. But it's the same general idea, but they really only love it when their guys in power. Sure. Yeah. And that goes from both ways. That goes for democratic, you know, uh, Christians and Republican. We, we love these verses when they pertain to somebody who is doing something that we like. Now I want us to draw attention to what you said at the very beginning, Peter, mm -hmm. we, we need to be, viciously careful how we read this text because yeah. Peter is writing about Nero. Yeah. Peter is writing about an oppressive Rome with brothers and sisters being murdered for the name of Jesus. Yeah. Let's not forget. Let's make a very painful point. Peter is martyred. Mm -hmm. He dies for this. Peter is actually murdered by the state that he is saying that we need to respect. So, so we have to keep this in our mind as opposed to just using this verse as a bludgeon for our per particular thought of how we think the world should be run. But then, yeah. could you yeah, not then saying, ask the question? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, could then you not ask the question, is Peter being a little naive here? Is Peter, what's his game? What is Peter trying to accomplish here if he's writing this about a man 
and a government that is fully oppressive and persecuting, you know, and, and I have my chat, but what were you going to say? Go for it. Well, I was going to say, keeping it within the context here, he's talking about being a light, living honorably, doing all these things. And he's talking metaphorically about this, this submit to all human authority, whether the king or the head of state or the officials is pointed for the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. Peter is saying, in my opinion, that our head is our king, is Jesus. Um, it's this idea that you are foreigners. Again, you are aliens here. You are strangers in this land. And it is that we live under a different kingship. We live under a different set of rules. Mm -hmm. So pay, pay honor, pay tribute, do what you do based on the law of the land. But within the certain confines of your king is different. That's right. Because he's going to move into, and I don't want to get there yet, because he's going to move into talking to Christians. Before he's talking about specific slaves, he calls Christians slaves. That's right. That's a very important segue from from submitting to your authority and being called slaves absolutely I, so, I i completely agree and and you know to me i think this verse is very freeing and yeah. here's why i think this verse is freeing peter knows history peter knows that god has used cyrus peter knows that god has used xerxes peter knows that god has used pharaoh peter knows that god has used nebuchadnezzar Peter knows that God has used some of the worst tyrants, okay, that have ever lived and still accomplished his purposes. Yeah. So right. to me, this verse frees us from needing political power to bring about the kingdom of God or needing the state's power. Yeah. Peter never, ne, Peter nor Paul never say align yourself with a governmental power system they say right. align yourself with jesus that's right and then live accordingly within the land so we're not saying be anarchists we're not saying be zealots we're not saying be absolutely antagonistic to everybody that disagrees with us um we're also not saying be silent and not do anything no your life is to live honorably but there are times that we can become too encumbered by the state to bring about our end. I mean, could you imagine somebody walking in to the first century church and saying, hey, we really, 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 really need, you know, this guy, Nero, to side with us on these things. Sure, they might have thought that, but we never see that in scripture. We just see, hey, look, whether it's a great guy in power or whether it's the worst guy in power, God is on the throne. Whether yeah. it's a guy that does everything we want or whether it's a guy that does nothing that we want, we still get to be Christians. We still get to, remember what he says, show the goodness of God. A lot of times we think the goodness of God is arguing with people that disagree with us politically on both sides. I, don't, I, don't, I think Peter frees us from that here. I think yeah. he beautifully frees us to say, hey, regardless, and then again, we get to live a life, but regardless, we get to trust that Jesus is on the throne. And so he turns around. It's like you says, it's our honorable lives that silence people. It's, it's, it's not being pushed and moved by the winds of even political change and everything. It's being a person of integrity and goodness in your life, regardless of what's happening. And then you absolutely called it. You are free, yet you are God's slave. And then look at where he comes to the end of the chapter. And here's where we're going to go. You who are slaves must submit to your masters with all respect. Do what they tell you, not only if they're kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel. For God is pleased when conscious of his will, you patiently endure unju unju unjust treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing right and you endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is our example, and you must follow in his steps. And I'm going to save the quotation. Yeah. We need to set a contextual stage again. Yeah. We, we don't need to soften what slavery was during that time. Right. 
now you now now there 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 are definitely tears of slavery you know you have a slavery where you are forced into it and over no control over yourself you have a slavery during this time where you could actually choose to be a slave for a period of time to help pay off some of your debt to to accrue things that that you need but we don't need to reduce the fact that that made that like if, even if we say you know well you worked for them no you were still treated as a slave you were absolutely dehumanized you were you were at their whims in some pretty brutal ways so i think it is safe for us to say that peter is going to the worst dehumanizing feature that we have and that's a human being owning another human being that is the absolute dehumanization of another person made in the image of God and feeling that they are less than what God created them to be. They are property. Yeah. Peter is specifically going here to make a point. You know, um, N.T. Wright, I like how he says this. He actually says that, you know, Peter is sailing really close to the wind here because he's going dangerously close to, you know, this idea of, now, wait a second. What's he trying to tell slaves? Now, there's a whole nuance here. Um, as you all know, and guys, if you're not students of history, I mean, the church can be kind of hard, but one of the great splits in the Civil War was the issue of slavery in a religious sense. Churches split because churches, some churches believed that the Bible ordained slavery because Paul nor Peter never says, you know, explicitly, get rid of your slaves. In fact, he tells the slaves how to act. And if you, this is painful, but if you don't think that this scripture was used to shut slaves up, then you need to do some reading of history. And that's where, that's what I think what N.T. Wright is saying, that we're coming real close to the wind here, that people have used this scripture for brutal, brutal things. Um, so I'll let you go first then, Jeremy, because I have my, I mean, I have my take as we close this out, but, but, but where, 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 what's one of the things that Peter is trying to tell us here with this, with this truth that he's talking about? Well, I've obviously got a lot to say on the subject, but I will try to keep it um, somewhat short so you can get yours in. So I don't want to stumble over anything you're going to do, but um, you know, here in this situation, again, we talk about historical context. And he's just said, submit to your leaders, which are the worst, right now, the worst leader that Rome has ever going to, has ever going to, is ever going to have or, or is going to have during this time, leading to the great persecution um, of Christians. And so one of the truths that is coming i think is that that rome is going to increase or enhance this persecution making most christians slaves most mm -hmm. most of most jews slaves um and they're going to to do so in a massive way what's ironic to me about this passage is it's peter who was looking to Jesus to deliver them from the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. just very much like the Jews were doing then and the current Jews do today, looking for a Messiah that's going to just reign over the world and, and just crush every other world authority, this powerful king that's going to come in. And so Paul Peter has had a radical shift in his theology because now he is saying, even amidst the greatest persecution, those who are mistreated, because you were about to be mistreated, should live honorably. Don't allow your circumstances to, um, to control your morality or your ethics. Mm -hmm. He's saying Jesus is still the one that controls your ethics. To me, we, we talk talk about this persecution, but I, I can tell you without, I think with about a hundred percent certainty, if Americans were overthrown tomorrow and someone came in and began persecution, true persecution, like we're seeing here, 
it would be very Roman-esque of the times where, you know, um, would Christians bow to the authority of the empire and, re and, and recant their faith because they lost everything, mm -hmm. because the circumstances were too great. And so it was like that article, I think, if you saw it, that I sent you today of the reality of the church meeting, having a Zoom meeting in China, and nine of them were taking, taken out of their homes during the worship service, arrested, taken away, some were detained, some got years in prison, some came home. We just don't get persecution. We don't understand it. We think, oh, man. We think we're persecuted because our technology but, didn't work. <laughs> Yeah, right, right on. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, Peter is getting extremely heavy here to yep. use one of the most um, degrading jobs that there is to say, stay strong yep. in the middle of your, because you know, as well as I do, and I'll, I'll say, I'll give you Philemon, you can go there, because that's the other issue is, yep. it, so is Paul then saying, that slavery is okay. All right, go. So uh, in order to really adjust this, you know, you have to say, okay, if slavery was normal in that context, you know, where is the teaching? Um, I actually think the teaching is all through scripture. Peter is not making an argument for or against slavery right now. Peter's right. making the very argument, Jeremy, that you just made. Hey, no matter the, the, the worst scenario you could possibly imagine, you still are a changed human, right? And so when you look at Paul, yeah. Paul talks about, Paul has a few places where he says, hey, slave owners, slave owners, treat yeah. your slaves well. And that's where we're start, we start thinking, man, that's Paul. What, what's going on? Well, I think the teachings of Peter and Paul make it abundantly clear that we're not supposed to dehumanize. And I believe that Paul wants the owners to come to the decision themselves that we're not going to own people. And so that enters Philemon, this weird chapter, one chapter book, where Paul talks to Philemon about a slave named Onesimus. And Paul basically says, hey, Onesimus ran away from you, but you and I are close. And hey, buddy, there's a lot of neat stuff in this tiny little chapter where Paul basically says, because of who I am and because of who Jesus is, I want you to welcome him back as a brother. I think Philemon one of its reasons it's in the canon is to show how Paul wanted people to come to the conclusion themselves that we are not going to own human beings. Now, right. again, I don't think that's where Peter's going. I think he's doing exactly what you said. Peter is saying, hey, right now slavery exists. And in fact, a lot of slaves were becoming Christians. I mean, are you surprised? Oppressed people, you know, wanting something bigger than their situation, right? So more slaves are coming to Jesus and becoming Christians. And so can you imagine this teaching? But then this is what Peter does that I think is just absolutely beautiful. And it's in verse 21. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering. And here it is, just as Christ suffered for you. Yeah. He is your example, which that's the only place, by the way, in the Bible, in the New Testament, where the word pattern is literally used. And it's not a pattern for worship. It's a pattern for Jesus's life as a suffering servant. And you must follow in his steps. And then he quotes Isaiah 53 to close the chapter. He never sinned, nor he was deceived, nor deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins and his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Here's what Peter's saying. Slaves, the worst thing possible. Jesus knows. Jesus suffered with you and he left it in the hands of God. He is your great shepherd. Please know that when you are suffering as a slave, somehow, paradoxically, we don't know completely why, you are sharing in that glorious suffering and it actually makes you more like Jesus. So it's exactly like you're saying. 
hey guys, things are about to get really hard. You're about to suffer really, really, really bad. Things are about to get very challenging. You're gonna be treated as slaves. Some of you already are slaves. Just know that Christ knows what you've gone through. He suffered through the same things and his stripes heal you. They make you whole. He is your shepherd. Keep relying on him and know that no matter who's in power, no matter what's going on, living honorably in the midst of that, that's what kingdom living is all about. That's what being a living stone, a holy temple is all about. It's about facing all of this suffering and adversity and knowing that Jesus did it and by his stripes we're healed and we've got this. And, and I, I just want to point out, we'll, get, we'll give you one, give one more thought in, into it um, because I want to make sure that our listeners don't think that we are advocating that you live in abusive situations. Mm, yes. You know, I'm in an abused marriage, so I guess, you know, um, my husband or my wife beats me, so I'm going to have to live in that situation because, because, you know, we got married and that's the right thing. God hates divorce. And therefore I just, as a good Christian, I'm going to have to endure that abuse and put my children at risk and put my life at risk and all that. That is not who yes. Peter is talking to. He, he is talking to people who literally are obligated to something that they cannot get out of or cannot That's control. Right. And, and so, and then I think in Galatians three, you see him marrying Paul's theology because he takes the very identity of, of slaves there and says that now for those of you who have faith in Jesus Christ and you've been united with Christ in baptism and have put on Christ. In other words, now you are clothed with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, slave or free. In other words, you might be a slave by trade, but in Jesus, you are now clothed with Christ. Amen. That's, that's what Peter, I think, is, is saying to the people. Is, Absolutely. This is it. So guys, thank y'all. We're, we're, we're actually over our time. We wanted to get this streaming to y'all. Lots of technical issues tonight. Um, and so we hope you enjoyed this. You can go back and watch this. We're going to, we're about to put it on live. It's going to be on YouTube. Pour over that. Jeremy, I'm going to say a quick prayer and then I'm going to, I'm going to get this. Go for it. I'm about to go fight a ninja. All right, God, we love you. We thank you for Peter. We thank you that, that we can get into his deeper teachings, father. And, uh, and, and I pray that, that what we see is, is that you remain on this throne and Jesus is the cornerstone, Father, and that's the beautiful truth. And we get to live in that truth no matter the situation, Father. All of this in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Bye, see, you see you in a little bit. Bye.